please pray with me? Holy God, as we turn our thoughts toward you, open our hearts to your way of truth and love. Drive away the things which distract us from faith. Clear out the temptation to judge and blame. Cleanse us with your spirit so we can share your grace with pure hearts. Help us walk with humility as we follow Jesus, wherever he might lead. Amen. We continue our Lenten journey this morning with a story from the second chapter of the Gospel of John. And I'm, I'm a little shorter today because I'm sitting in a wheelchair. So it's not going to be as my n- normal smooth, suave self because I have stuff, papers and stuff around me I have to pick up every now and then. So just bear with me. This is from the second chapter of John, beginning with verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle, and he also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, This temple's been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is a well-known story because we know that it's a good example of when Jesus was angry. You, you, you often hear that. Remember, Jesus himself got angry. Remember when he threw the money changers out of the temple. What we tend to not remember are the details. So these Lenten themes of repentance and turning and going in another way, we've examined the relationship between um, Moses and God, as Reverend Paul Eaton discussed last week, that God's faithfulness to us isn't dependent on any particular situation. And in the midst of the most unexpected situations and conclusions and, and, and stories and endings, God is still there and still working in the in the middle of what seems to be something that either doesn't make sense or isn't fair. So during the season of Lent, we've been remembering so far God's faithfulness to us and examining ways in our own personal lives we can be more faithful. But in this particular story, it's a story about a, 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 a religious setting in the temple So it's repentance, for sure, turning and going in another direction, but it isn't a personal repentance that Jesus is discussing or actually kind of living out in this case. It's an institutional repentance, if you think about it. All four Gospels have this story recorded. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have this exact same story, but those three Gospels put this story toward the end of the Gospels. After Jesus has ridden the donkey into Jerusalem, this story happens in those three Gospels and is part of the explanation of how Jesus offended all the religious rulers and in the end it contributed to um, his crucifixion. However, in the Gospel of John, you notice it's in chapter 2, like it's right up front. Because John wants us, I think, to see that Jesus is determined to not only turn individual experiences with God upside down, but is also determined to turn the, the, the conventional way of worship completely upside down. The whole business gets turned on its head. So what's going on in the temple that upset Jesus so? Well, it's all about being clean or being pure. Marcus Borg, who's a, um, a, a theologian, New Testament theologian, talks about Jesus as challenging the vast purity system. 
It was a system, according to Borg, that had profound implications for all of life. The effect of the purity system was to create a world with sh sharp social boundaries between pure and unpure, righteous and unrighteous. The, um, the purity system set up a sort of who's in and who's out and made it pretty clear. It was a lot easier to just glance at someone if you knew they were unclean or unpure. You could avoid them completely. So what was happening in the temple were, were rites of purity. Um, people from certain bloodlines, for instance, deck was stacked against them. They would have had to pay more to become pure. Women, if they had had a baby, would be unpure. So there were lots of rites and rituals to um, establish purity. And the temple was at the very heart of this purity system. And the animals that were being sold there were for sacrificial purposes. But the only way, reason, the only way really to attain purity was to offer a sacrifice. So that's what the animals were for. I mean, it wasn't like they were buying a pig at the Lorraine County Fair. They were purchasing um, animals, doves, sheep, whatever, in order to sacrifice them at the altar to purify themselves. Okay, well, think about it. Only the rich people could afford the really good animals. So if a, if a lamb was going to make you more pure than a dove, but you needed 500 bucks for a lamb and all you had was 150, then you'd have to get a dove. But your, pure, your, um, your purity wouldn't be quite as pure as if you'd had a lamb. Okay, and so the money changers, you, you, th there was a, a, a law that you could not purchase animals for sacrifice with Roman coins, so they had to exchange the Roman coins to, to, to get coins that, for, that were um, appropriate for purchasing these animals. And of course, whoever was changing the money probably kept a little for themselves. You know, it's like those when you dump your coins in those coin changer counter things, it always keeps some, kind of like that. So what was happening was those who couldn't afford it, those who were poor, or those who didn't have any means or resources, like the rich people did, were, were just getting screwed at the temple. Like it was, it was the rich folks that were getting the goods, and the the poor people couldn't didn't have enough buying power to purify themselves in the same way that the rich folks did. Well, <laughs> that hacked Jesus off, and I mean to the bone. Even though I think John is a really difficult gospel to make heads or tails of oftentimes because he's really abstract and symbolic, in this story, the divine and the human are, are, are very concretely combined in the person of Jesus. Destroy the temple, Jesus says, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, understandably, that was confusing. What? 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 It's been 46 years this temple's been under construction. Really? Jesus, you think you can put it back together in three days? But of course, Jesus is talking about his body. So in this case, he's combining the, 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 the physical place where we worship is the temple. Jesus is claiming that for himself. He is, he is the place to worship. He is the place where you will find God. He is the place that embodies grace and spirit and truth. And so everything that's going on in the, in the physical temple itself totally offends him. Jesus' body, flesh and blood and bone and arms that hug and heal. Eyes that squint into the sun to see what's going on with all those people who are sitting out there who are hungry and need to be fed. His hands that healed the blind man also wove those cords into whips and drove all of those unfair people with their unfair practices right out of the temple. What Jesus couldn't tolerate was a lack of compassion and a lack of what was fair in the eyes of God. Not about not fair what's in the eyes of people who put the rules together, but in the eyes of God. What Jesus couldn't condone was the divisions that were maintained in the temple itself. What Jesus refused to do was turn a blind eye when faith got exchanged for rituals and rules. But you know, it's human nature. Whenever we experience something really important or significant, like faith, what we do is, is, is establish some rules. Okay, if you, if you want to experience faith, then do these three things. Pray in this way. The same thing happened with a democracy. 
when they experience the importance and the significance of, of a true democratic society, they put rules into place. Here's what you do to maintain that society. Here's what we'll do to maintain the integrity of a democracy. It's the same thing they did in the temple. But what happens is that the rules become far more important than the participants who are following the rules. And then instead of looking at faith, we look at rules and we decide who's in and who's out by who's following the rules most, most carefully. It's, it's human nature. And Jesus challenged, challenged that. The rules can't be more important than the people. Nothing can stand in the way. Nothing can stand between the people and God. And if you're somebody that happens to be maintaining those religious rules, well, then you're somebody that Jesus would have fussed at. There was a kid in the youth group, Herbie Highwaters. He was, he was just, God, he was such a, God love him, he was just a geek. But he was an innocent geek. He didn't know he was a geek. He didn't know that the kids laughed at him and kind of made fun of him. And we got, our, our youth group got invited to join another church at a revival. And so we went and the kids, you know, they eat supper together and then they went to the sanctuary and the guest preacher was preaching. This was on a Sunday night and the lights were low and, you know, there was, uh, you know, candles on the altar and there was an altar call and people came forward and um, it, there was, you know, a, a, a hymn sung while the kids knelt. It was a wonderful evening. Okay, so we all leave and we pile back in the bus and we're missing one. We count off and somebody's missing. Well, it's Herbie. So I, I run back in, the bus is ready to go. I run back in the church and I found Herbie in the sanctuary and he's kneeling still at the altar. Everybody's gone, it's dark in there. I said, Herbie, come on, we, we need to get on the bus. And he said, just a minute, just one more minute. I heard Jesus call my name and I wanna see if he'll call me one more time. I'm telling you, he was a big geek. But he believed that Jesus called him. Hard to make fun of that. Herbie got back on the bus. The other kids kind of rolled their eyes and finally we headed home. <laughs> he didn't follow the rules. He wasn't cool. He was Herbie. I ran into one of those kids from the youth group not long ago. About four or five years ago, I went uh, back to Louisiana to visit some folks from that church. And I was meeting with some of the kids from that youth group who of course are now all adults and they have kids of their own. And I asked about Herbie, you know, we were catching up, like what happened to this, this kid? What happened to that girl? And, and I asked about Herbie. Herbie became a missionary. As far as I know, <laughs> Herbie changed lives because Herbie was just innocent enough to believe that Jesus really had called him. He wasn't very good at following the rules and being part of the in crowd. But he sure did love the Lord. to represent the, the bread and the cup 
Whatever you have in your home will be just fine. It isn't the stuff itself, it's the presence of Christ that makes the elements holy. So it can be a biscuit or a cracker, it can be juice or water or wine. These things are the, the ordinary means of grace that God will use to impart to us grace. Let us pray. Holy God, during the season of Lent, when we're reminded of the passion of Jesus and the grace you have for all of us, we give you thanks for calling us to your table, as imperfect as we are, because we're not here because of our merit or because we deserve to be. We're here only because you called us to be. All that's required is a sincere desire to know the love and grace of Jesus Christ. So we pray in this time that you will bless this bread and this cup and make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Help us to receive them with grace, with contrite hearts. We admit that we aren't good enough. We are only here because we belong to you. Forgive us for those things we've done and left undone and prepare our hearts to receive your grace that we might share it with everyone we meet. In his name, amen. We remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, lift your bread, he gave thanks, and he broke the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, lift your cup, and again, he gave thanks and he said, drink this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember Jesus until he comes again. Take your bread. Through the brokenness of Jesus Christ, our brokenness is made whole. As we empty the sacred cup, our emptiness is filled. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, having been fed at Christ's table, we go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.